confused incorrectly. In computer vision, applying feature detection is really a matter of choosing the correct algorithm and tuning it properly. But how can we do this? It comes from intuition that is based on theory and knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the algorithm. Did you know that the Harris Corners detector can detect edges? Did you know that the Harris Corner detector struggles with imperfect corners, but do you know why? That's what we're going to find out today. So in this video, we're going to try to go through some intuition with the Harris Corner detector. We're going to see intuitively how it was derived from something called the Morvex Corner detector. And we're also going to code it from scratch and then use OpenCV to learn how to tune it on real images. And we're going to try and see what each fat tuning parameter does to the algorithm. So let's get started. So a corner is where two edges meet together. So we see we have a, a vertical edge here and then a diagonal edge here that meet together to make a corner. So we could really see this window right here. If we place a window around a pixel, which we'll call the pixel under test, and slide it around a couple in a couple of different directions. And if we were to take the sum of all the pixels each time we slide it around, we were to get we're going to get a value. So if we slide this window four times and sum it up each time, we're going to get four values. In the case of this flat region, we're basically going to get a the same value each time. So if we're going to put our pixel under test on an edge, if we slide it up and slide it down, we should get a similar value. But if we slide it left and slide it right, we should get different values from where we originally had our window. And furthermore, if we put our pixel under test, assume that it's this corner right here, if we take this right here and then we slide it up, down, left, right, we're going to get a different value each time. So there's going to be a significant change every time we slide the window. And this means that the gradients are basically varying. So we can see how this is written mathematically. We have our window defined by W. We have our original window right here centered at UV and we have our shifted window right here and we basically take the sum of squared intensities. So this is this is called Morvex quarter detector and it's what the Harris quarter detector was able to improve on. So let's get a little bit of intuition for what the Harris quarter detector does and we're going to see how it expanded this function right here or this expression. It basically used a Taylor expansion across the shift center to get a convenient expression that Harris and Stevens in the original paper studied and were able to find out how to exploit it. And we'll see that later. So this example right here, we have this image of a perfect quarter with added noise. Here we have the horizontal gradient and the vertical gradient. So you can see this horizontal gradient as we traverse the image from left to right we are constant here, constant, 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 then boom, we get a change right here. And that's what this is right here. And then we go, once again, we're constant, constant, constant. Same with the vertical gradient. As we go from bottom to top or top to bottom, we are constant right here. We get a little bit of a change that shows up right here. But right here, we get no change, which also shows up right there as we don't have a gradient. And then once again, we're constant. And you can see that right here. In this right plot right here, we have a scatter plot of the x versus the y gradients, the horizontal versus vertical gradients. And we can see we have three distinct clusters. This first one right here comes from the flat region of the image. So right here we have basically nothing and nothing here. And the only reason it's non-zero is because of the added noise. And this top part right here, we have the large vertical gradient. And this part on the right, we have the large x gradient or horizontal gradient. So you can see that because we have a corner right here, we have a large variation between the X and the Y gradient. So that's kind of goes back to Morvex detector, where as we shift, no matter where we shift, we have a large change in intensities. And that is basically, this is basically a more mathematical way to describe that large change in intensities. So let's also look at an example with just a horizontal edge we can see that we have a large vertical change in intensities, hence this large vertical gradient, but not much in the horizontal gradient. The horizontal gradient is just noise. So how do we efficiently get these gradients? This is great for intuition, but how can we do this 
and be computationally efficient. Better yet, how do we do this for every pixel in an image, like Harris does? So what they did was they did this nice derivation. They took the Taylor expansion, and there's two ways you could do this. You could take the Taylor expansion of this whole term about U and V, or you could just do this this term right here, like I did. And basically, we get this quadratic right here, where we have the this A, C, A, B, and C are the product of derivatives. So we have the product of two horizontal derivatives, the product of two vertical derivatives, and the product of the horizontal and vertical derivatives in the off diagonal axis. So what they, they could do, what they did was, is they studied this quadratic, and it turns out that in this quadratic format, you could describe it with the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are going to determine the variance in each principal direction. And in this case, the eigenvalues are going to determine the total variation of all the, of the image gradients in all directions. And it turns out we could use this to classify whether a pixel is a corner or a flat region. So right here, if we have two small eigenvalues, it's going to be flat. So if we're, change, if we're shifting our window around and not getting much change or not getting much variation, we're in a flat region. If we get a change in one direction and not the other, we're going to be on an edge. And if we get changes in all directions, we're going to be on a corner. So it turns out that you know, computing the eigenvalues is computationally expensive, but it turns out that we could actually exploit some matrix properties that allow us to not compute the eigenvalues. So Harris and Stevens came up with this empirical thing called the corner response, which is the determinant of M minus K, which is a hyperparameter hyper times the square of the trace of M. And it turns out the determinant of a matrix is equal of this matrix equal to the first eigenvalue times the second eigenvalue, and the trace is the first eigenvalue plus the second eigenvalue. And we could actually, this is actually what is used to compute the Harris corner response. So right here, we have an algorithm to, com to compute it. We just compute the horizontal and vertical derivatives, then the products, and we apply a smoothing kernel. So if we don't use any smoothing, we get a lot of noise. And any type of smoothing will do. And this is one of the improvements that Harris made to Morvex corner detector. And then we simply compute the response, and then we threshold. So we want to set another hyperparameter, some threshold, where this response is greater than a certain value to get a corner. So that's going to be when it comes down to this right here. So if we want to be sensitive to corners, we set a low threshold and get a lot of corners. Or if we want to be insensitive to corners, we set a high threshold to get a low amount of corners. But this also brings another important aspect is that we could compute edges with this corner response. Edges are going to be less than zero. So we could actually set a negative threshold and compute the, and compute the response for edges. So we'll see that later. But I actually want to bring up another trade-off, and we could see with some test windows. So the algorithm is nice because it exploits the matrix properties that allow us to not compute the eigenvalues. But since we're not computing the eigenvalues and hence not computing the eigenvectors, we're actually missing out on some good information. So here to the left, we could see some test images of noise, some edges, and some various types of corners. And we can see their scaled eigenvectors right here. So their eigenvectors scaled by their eigenvalues. And we can see for these regular types of image, regular types of you know test images, the flat surface, we have basically nothing. They're both going to be small. The edge, we have one super large eigenvalue denoting the super large variation. And same with the vertical edge. And the other eigenvalue is very small. But you can see for these different types of corners, that there's a rotation for each of them. Now, this corner on the left could be a good feature to track, as with the sharp corner right here. But this blunt corner, this is almost like an edge, and we might not really care about it. But this sharp corner right here seems like it could be a really good feature to track, as it could come from a real, 
you know, if this was actually in a real image or something similar to this in a real image, it could come from a real object rather than a shadow or something absolute little, you know, not reliable to track. But this also brings up something right here. We do have a large eigenvalue representing the variation in this direction and a small eigenvalue here. And this also brings up an issue that we could actually misclassify the sharp corner, AKA this good feature to track if we're not careful. So, and this is a weakness of the Harris corner detector that we can't really do much about besides tune hyperparameters. It's inherent, this information is inherently not present in the detector. So we don't have this rotation information. So that is another thing that could be improved upon, but we're going to leave that for another time. So here, here I have some code and all I do is I just have this thing where we could just change the different, different values of K to see how it responds. So ba basically the value of K, if we have a large K, we're going to be less sensitive and get less corners. If we have a small K, we're going to be more sensitive. There's not much to see there. So let, let's go through how to code this algorithm from scratch. So when we go, let's go to this top right here. So when we compute the horizontal and vertical image derivatives, we could actually use the Sobel operator for that. And then computed the products of the derivatives is just a one one to one matrix multiplication the gaussian smoothing we just do a we just use a convolution operation with the gaussian kernel computing the corner response is some is as simple as just computing this right here it's just one line of code and then we threshold so let's see let's see how to do this so here's our kernels here's our sobel x and our sobel y which is just the transpose of a sobel x here's our gaussian kernel right here and here's our function for the corner response. So we just compute the first derivatives, Gaussian filter, the products of the derivatives, and compute the response. So let's see how this works out a test image. So here's our test image of bricks. So this is a very obvious image, lots of good corners in here. So we're gonna get a lot of responses. So here's our, here's our hyperparameters. And so we're going to so here's our first step. We compute the corner response and we can dilate the response. This turns out it helps a little bit, but it's not strictly necessary. And then we apply the thresholding. So we take our threshold and we're going to, going to find the good corners right here. So and we could see, let's actually go ahead and look at our corner response. Let's look at our dilated corner response. So we can see right here, we have corners and edges. So you can see these corners, let's add a color bar. So you can see right here, this these corners right here, these strong corner responses are positive and these weak corner responses, AKA edges right here are gonna be negative. And the values that are <coughs> close to zero are the flat values. And actually, we might be able to change let's change the color mapping to see if we can see this better. Let's try a jet. Okay, this is a little bit. We can see these strong corner responses really stand out, and these negative ones also stand out. So, okay, so that's pretty cool. So let's go back up here. Let's go to we threshold our corners. And as a bonus, most people don't do this. They just use the canny edge detector. We could actually apply a negative threshold and detect edges. And that's what we're doing right here. So you could see that there's a lot of, if we were to put our corner thresh right here and just do a simple threshold, we get these blobs on the image. So what we want to do is Take these blobs for each blob. We want to basically centroid them and do it do our non-maximal suppression. So that's what we're going to do right here. We're going to find find centroids, and we're going to basically go down, do or not find the center of each quarters, and go to a subpixel accuracy. And I re I recommend that you look at the OpenCV documentation with both of these right here. So this output right here is going to be a list of corners, and we're going to draw it on a copy of this image. 
And that's what we have right here. We have our our corners drawn on our original image and our thresholded edges. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to end this video right here. And the next video, we're going to go over how to do this with OpenCV and we're going to see how each of the hyperparameters work in OpenCV. All right, I'll see y'all in the next one.